The scripture reading this morning is from Deuteronomy, chapter 26, verses 1 through 11, translated by Eugene Peterson in The Message. Once you enter the land that God, your God, is giving you as an inheritance and take it over and settle down, you are to take some of all the first fruits of what you could grow in the land that God, your God, is giving you. Put them in a basket and go to the place God, your God, sets apart for you to worship him. At that time, go to the priest who is there and say, I announce to God, your God, today that I have entered the land that God promised our ancestors that he'd give to us. The priest will take the basket from you and place it on the altar of God, your God. And there, in the presence of God, your God, you will recite, a wandering Aramean was my father. He went down to Egypt and sojourned there. He and just a handful of his brothers at first, but soon they became a great nation, mighty and many. The Egyptians abused and battered us in a cruel and savage slavery. We cried out to God, the God of our fathers. He listened to our voice. He saw our destitution, our trouble, our cruel plight. And God took us out of Egypt with his strong hand and long arm, terrible and great, with signs and miracle wonders. And he brought us to this place, gave us this land, flowing with milk and honey. So here I am. I've brought the first fruits of what I've grown on this ground you gave me, O oh God. And rejoice. Celebrate all the good things that God, your God, has given you and your family, you and the Levite and the foreigner who lives with you. Roger and I have our Sundays confused. I'll just admit to you, we're starting Thanksgiving a week early. It's not because we're confused on the dates, but because the story of American Thanksgiving is not just a story of thanks, which we'll talk about next week, but it's a story of giving. For both Native Americans and Native Europeans, this season of harvest that we mark and call Thanksgiving began with a call to give. The Wampanoags, uh, who shared their harvest festival with the pilgrims hundreds of years ago, had long marked this season by sharing their harvest with one another. That was their tradition after a summer and fall of planting and growing, of hunting and gathering. They would bring in the harvest, and they would share a portion of all that they had grown, all that they had gathered and hunted with the community. For no Wampanoag was going to go through the winter starving to death. Everyone would have food, the eldest and the sickest, the youngest and the most vulnerable, for they would have received food from this <coughs> harvest offering food to get them through a cold East Coast winter. You may not know about those if you've always lived in California, but they are bitter. This earth would also receive an offering. That earth that had given them the harvest would also receive an offering, for the Native Americans would go out and pour grain and juice in the same soil from which they had harvested grain and berries. They would give that as their offering to God and to God's good earth. And then they would bury special rocks and shells and pearls. You know, they have pearls on the East Coast, too. And for them, they were gems because they gave them to God. They would bury them out of gratitude for the years past with their prayers for an abundant and healthy winter ahead. And then their tribal leaders would bless those offerings and also receive a portion to support their families throughout the winter ahead. Now, when the pilgrims arrived, this would have been a tradition they also were familiar with. For Europeans had been making similar offerings for at least a thousand years. Caring for the poor and the aged, the young and the vulnerable 
with their harvest offerings each fall, giving a portion to their priests and to the temple, and then sharing rituals of gratitude for the year past, alongside prayers for the winter ahead. For dare I say, winter in Northern Europe is even harsher than an East Coast winter in America. The point here is that God does not change across cultures, and people aren't actually as different as we think we are. Across lands, across oceans, and the traditions were the same. And this is precisely what Deuteronomy 26 is all about, whether read in the ancient Hebrew or in the modern words of Eugene Peterson. For it is a story of priests some 3,000 years ago instructing the Israelites in how to create a community of faith when they come into the promised land and how to live as a community of God. So they called the people together to give a first portion of each year's harvest as a, as a consistent annual offering to God. This American Thanksgiving that we think is all, all ours, it kind of started in Deuteronomy 26 for the Judeo-Christian people. Because offering a portion of the harvest in gratitude to God has been a tradition and is a tradition in agrarian communities around the globe. I looked it up. Thank you, Google and Wikipedia. So here are just some examples. Amish folks, I bet you know this, right? They raise barns for one another. They build houses for one another. That is their harvest offering. In Ghana, now I bet you didn't know this, guess what the fruit of the earth is they use in Ghana? Anybody got it? I'll buy you lunch. <laughs> okay, yams. That's right, it's a yam celebration in Ghana. They offer yams and they create a three-day feast with all of the foods that they create from those yams as they offer those yams to the poorest of the poor, to God, and to one another. In Korea, they bring their offerings to the graves of their ancestors under the harvest moon. And in Vietnam, they celebrate by dedicating themselves, the adults, to their children and honoring their children under the harvest moon, that they might be a blessing that their children will grow and carry on their beliefs and their traditions. And in India, they bring offerings to the festival fires, and there they bring their gifts and celebrations. From the first moment of human creation, we have heard a call to give, to share with one another. We are created with a need to give. We feel that deep yearning to connect with others, to help in whatever ways we can, paint a fence, read a scripture, sing a beautiful song. Because we are created for connection. We are created for giving and sharing and helping. The creation stories of Genesis reflect this truth for us. For God calls us, saying, it is not good that man or woman should be alone. We are created to be in community with one another. And then God says, and you, I give you dominion over all. I give you responsibility for all of creation. Name the animals. Care for the earth. For this is your responsibility. We are created and called to give, to care, to share. And when we answer that call, you heard it from Ed, you get this sense of unexpected joy, a sense of fulfillment. It comes because you have fed that deep hunger within that God has planted there the hunger to give, to connect, to help, and to share. The giving that God calls the Hebrew people to when they first settle in the promised land is a giving so that they will regularly answer that call and fulfill that yearning, the yearning that they would have had in those earliest days to give thanks and to give to one another 
from that promised land flowing with milk and honey. Now, there are lots of ways we give, and one of the most dramatic stories of giving in this country came after the attacks on 9-11. Do you want to guess how much Americans gave to just the American Red Cross that year? More than the American Red Cross had ever received for any disaster, any offering. $900 million just for relief efforts for those who endured the loss of those towers. But that wasn't all. Do you remember the time? Mikey, you don't remember it. <laughs> no, Mikey doesn't remember it, but we'll tell you about it, Mikey. It was a pretty cool time. The streets got quieter. People seemed gentler in the grocery stores. Did you notice that? Like we were nicer to each other for a bit. Then people gave vacation weeks so that they, they could go and join the first responders and help dig through the rubble to see if anyone was still there. A therapist in my parish took a month sabbatical from her very lucrative practice to go and give free counseling to those emergency responders who were traumatized months after the disaster. People gave in so many ways. New Yorkers just gathered around the site and prayed day after day after day. When tragedy strikes, we are amazing in answering the call to give. I think this is because we all have planted in us this deep need to give, to be connected to others, to help wherever and however we can. But we live in a world where we don't ask that much giving from each other. We don't demand that much. We don't always even see the need because we kind of hide from each other our deepest needs and the places where we need help and connection. But when all we do is answer to those big emergency needs, those big dramatic moments, it's more like giving our leftovers rather than our first fruits. God invites us, calls us even, to give from our first fruits, not just the leftovers. Not because God requires it or judges it, but because God knows it changes our lives and allows us to change God's world for the better. When I was a very young girl, I was truly blessed by Pastor Jim Powell, who taught us about tithing in our sixth grade confirmation class, but even more by Pastor Noel Spencer. Who names their kid Noel and doesn't know he's going to go to seminary? Anyway, his name was Noel. Pastor Noel Spencer, who invited us in eighth grade youth group to begin tithing. He didn't just teach us about it, he came to youth group and preached about it. He said, you can tithe from your babysitting money. You can tithe from your paper route money. Now when Pastor Powell had talked about giving our first 10% of every dollar we earn to God, that's what a tithe is, 10%, it sounded pretty cool in theory. I, in those days I received a $1 allowance from my parents and I thought, well, okay, so I give a dime and I'm done with it. Confession, I didn't give that many dimes. I thought about it, it seemed like a good idea, but it just never happened. But when Pastor Spencer came and challenged us in those later middle school years, he challenged us to take that call seriously. He explained what tithing was, an offering of that first 10% of all that we receive. And he admitted to us that in modern times, most people don't give that much. Many people tithe, even people who t say they tithe, tithe at a lower percentage, 2% or 3% or even 5%. There are lots of reasons for this. One is that you're more likely to get an IRS audit when you go above the 3% mark. Did you know that? I don't want to discourage your tithing. But the great thing is once you get above the mark, they kind of like, oh, they must be really good givers. And then they never look at you again. But that mark, that's, that's what the average American gives to charity, at least what they take deductions for, is only 2 or 3%. Pastor Spencer would say, that's a good place to start. A lot of people think, yeah, well, in ancient times there weren't taxes or social services or other nonprofits to care for the community, so 3% is enough. Pastor Spencer didn't debate the percentage. He was dealing with middle school kids. He knew we were going to debate him any minute. But he did teach us 
that disciplined giving would change our lives and would help us change the world. And what eighth grader doesn't want to change the world? Now, we were still middle school kids, and Pastor Spencer was an easy person to talk with, so the debates began. We were poor teenagers. Our parents already gave to the church. Did he, did, did he really think God? No, the priests were talking to the adults. Were the kids even in the crowd? We were good confirmation graduates. <laughs> then we debated whether our offerings could make any difference. Really, what's a tithe on a $10 babysitting allowance? That doesn't make any sense. And how could we afford pizza on Friday night? if we tithe to the church. Pastor Spencer had a way of just sitting silently. And then he gave us a scripture. It's a late scripture in the Old Testament from the book of Malachi, written at a time right before Jesus was born, when there were taxes. There was a Roman government. There were social services. And there were lots of different temples and businesses and poor people on the streets asking for money and support. Now the Israelites and the priests had gotten back to their homeland, they were back in their temple, but they were afraid. They were still occupied. They were afraid of being poor again, they were afraid of being kicked out again. The people were afraid to give to the temple and the priests were afraid to share from the temple treasury. It was a perfect disaster. They were all afraid, afraid that the connection with God wasn't strong enough and afraid they couldn't count on God. They were afraid their connection with each other wasn't strong enough, that they couldn't count on each other. And so they were afraid to give because they each started thinking they could only depend on him or herself. And so Malachi brings this word from God. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store all of it. It's a little bit like deciding to buy a parsonage with cash. What a crazy idea. Test me. And you said, okay, we'll test you, God. Pastor Spencer, after sharing that scripture, told us stories of when he and his wife were in seminary. And they only had enough to go out once a week for one hamburger that they shared. And still they tithed from his meager paycheck each week to the little student church that they served in Georgia. After all, he said, we did have enough for one hamburger. He said, even better, sometimes God would surprise him, as God promised to do through the prophet Malachi. A parishioner would pick up the check, or the diner chef would say, no charge today. Tithing doesn't mean everything suddenly goes perfectly, he taught us. But you do begin to realize that you are connected with God consistently and constantly, and that you're connected with your church and your sisters and brothers in your church in a way that reminds you, you are no longer alone. This type of connection actually bonded the, pilgrim, the, the pilgrims and the Wampanoags for many years. Now, I'm sure next week you'll start picking up the New York Times and the LA Times and National Geographic, and you'll hear the stories about how it fell apart eventually, and they went the way eventually of most European and Native American stories on this soil, falling into conflict and dispute, disease and war. But they began for almost a decade in peace under a harvest moon because they connected in giving and sharing and helping one another. Each community brought a portion of the summer's harvest. They blessed the offering, giving thanks to God, and shared it with one another. They helped one another store up for the winter, sharing with their eldest and their sickest, their youngest and their most vulnerable. And they connected in a way that, as far as we know, 
no other Native American and European American tribe did in those early days. <coughs> Maybe it's easier because they were farmers and hunters, gatherers and gardeners. Last spring, I was really inspired by Catherine Steller. She was out on our courtyard after she'd spent we many weekends planting, and she was sprinkling things. And I thought, is she making an offering? What's she doing here? She said, I'm, I'm feeding the new plants. And I have a special food I've brought for the trees. I'm feeding them. As she sprinkled and went around the garden, it was like a little Johnny Appleseed moment. As I watched her generous feeding of the gardens, I thought of these ancient traditions of offering our gifts to God, of pouring grain and, and juice upon the ground. And I thought, ah, oh, that offering to God's creation, maybe it's easier for gardeners. Or maybe it's harder. Because as she planted those plants and fed those trees, she didn't know for sure what would grow and what wouldn't, what was going to really take and be beautiful and what wasn't. If you ask her now, she will tell you the stories of lessons learned. She's learned some things worked out really, really well, and some things just didn't. But still, she kept planting and feeding those gardens. I think it is easier, perhaps, to hear and heed the call when we're gardeners and farmers. Because those earth's bounties are so obvious when you see a flower blooming or a tomato coming to ripening. But since so few of us are actually gardeners working the soil, the call to give is all the more important to listen for and to heed when we hear its call. For that call connects us again to the earth from which we were created and to the God who has created us and to one another who are this community called God's church. The homeless man outside your work, the child at school whose clothes don't quite measure up, or the ministry at church that touches your life, or the mission that pulls at your heartstring, the neighbor who needs your help. These are all calls to give. <clears throat> Have you been listening? These are invitations, an opportunity to give your gifts wherever you are called and wherever you are needed. The unexpected bonus check, a family inheritance, a winning lottery ticket, a surprising tax refund, and a large pay raise. Those are also calls to give. They offer an opportunity for you to remember all good gifts come from you, O oh Lord. Sent from heaven above, those are opportunities to share a portion of your blessings in gratitude to God who provides all blessings. The call to give doesn't need to wait for tragedy or disaster to strike. The need for generosity and giving is all around us every day, calling us, inviting us to share our gifts our talents, our time, our service, our experiences, that we might be blessed to be a blessing and then receive the blessing of answering the call to give. Test me, God says. Go ahead, test me. Test God and see how the blessings flow from the beauty of giving, giving yourself, and giving your gifts to God and God's world. Let us pray. <clears throat> Generous God of so many blessings, you who grant the harvest and the rain, the sunshine and this good earth, we give you thanks and praise for these many blessings. And we invite you to speak to us. Call us 
to be blessings to your world. And we will answer that call. We offer this prayer and those that rest silently on our hearts. In the name of your son, Christ Jesus, who heard that call and answered it so abundantly that he gave his very life as a gift to us. And we remember the words he taught us to pray as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation 